to thank you for taking a moment out of your afternoon to join me as we talk about a very often overshadowed story, especially in social and cultural history. And like so many other stories that we've delved into together here on Female Justice, uh, this one I initially came across uh, while reading an old newspaper. And I was actually very surprised at the amount of space this story was initially provided, as it actually deals with a pretty rare example of a gender nonconforming person being given the space to tell their story. And I am using air quotes with that, um, but we'll delve into the reasons why as we go along. Um, before we begin, a quick thank you to Isis, who's moderating our discussion today. So as she had mentioned, I do like to make our time together feel as conversational as possible. So if you have a comment, a question, a thought you'd like to share, please type those into the Q&A or chat boxes and she can read those out for you. Um, also, just a quick heads up, uh, today's program, we're going to be discussing domestic violence, uh, emotional and mental abuse, gender dysphoria, um, as well as other topics of a sexual nature. So if those are sensitive topics for you, uh, it might be a good idea to log off now. And lastly, for those that attended on Zoom today, as long as everything goes well, um, you'll be receiving an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. So if you had to leave for any reason, you'll be able to kind of pick up where you left off. Um, also, there's going to be an evaluation in there. If you could just take a moment to fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it to let us know how you feel about programs like this and also what we can do to improve them. Um, so with that, let's begin talking about our story of Ray Sargent. Now, for me, that's Ray there with the star on their, on their uh, picture. Um, the, at the center of this story is a question I would also like you to think about as we go through. And that is, why do gender stereotypes exist? What value is there or perceived value is there um, in designating that certain behaviors, attitudes, manners of dress, interests, jobs, um, any of these things have to be either masculine or feminine. Now, before we delve into the events in this particular story, I do want to talk very briefly about language and especially how we talk about people in the past. Um, Susan Stryker, who is a very well-respected um, lecturer, professor of trans history, is a trans woman themselves, and also a professor of women's gender and sexuality studies, along with others, have started using this term transing gender as we talk about uh, people from the past. And this is mainly because although their, their gender expressions, um, so their mannerisms, outward appearance, their behaviors differed from the expectations of how a masculine person would present in a given time or place. So how would a masculine male dress act behave in the 1920s versus a biological female in at the same time period? Um, because we can't assume or presume that these people from the past understood their identities in the same way that we discuss gender expressions today. And today we are focusing mainly on Ray Sargent, who we believe was biologically born female, but presented themselves as male for a large portion of their life and was arrested while they were transing gender. Um, but as you can see with some of the headlines that you see up on your screen, that their story isn't necessarily a unique one. Um, I collected some of these examples just by doing a quick search on newspapers.com uh, to see if I could find other stories of specifically biologically born women transing gender. And while they, like Ray, found themselves in similar circumstances um, and who today could potentially refer to themselves as transgender or non-binary or gender non-conforming, 
um, those terms didn't exist at the at various times, um, really not until 1965, I believe, that we get the first use of transgender. Um, so they literally didn't have the language to communicate some of those thoughts and feelings. Um, also, we can't say with any certainty why these people were transing gender. Transing gender. Uh, was it because it was an outward reflection of who they felt themselves most comfortable in being? Very possible. Um, could they have been transing gender because it afforded them certain rights, opportunities, um, ways of making more money, protection, um, self-sufficiency? Of course, all of these things are possible and not necessarily exclusionary of each other. Um, so it's a difficult question to answer um, because a lot of these stories only come to light because an arrest is made or a pretty severe injury has occurred, which isn't exactly safe spaces to talk about why you're presenting in a gender that is opposite of what you are biologically born as. Um, especially at a time when by having certain feelings could have you imprisoned, institutionalized, sterilized. Um, or some of these stories, like you can see on the screen, you know, played male part in life for 71 years are, is only discovered after someone has died. So they aren't even given the opportunity to give their full story. So with that all in mind, let's discuss Ray Sargent and their story. Sergeant Brittendall Sirod, three identities, one person. Now, the early part of Ray's life is a bit of a mystery. Um, there is a version of events that they told the San Francisco Examiner in May of 1924, when they were first kind of outed, publicly outed for being biologically female, but presenting male. And then there's the evidence that I could find in the historical record that paints a slightly different version of their initial upbringing. And that left me to wonder why they made changes to their story. Um, it could have been because they felt a need to protect those that were family members that might've still been alive um, when they were telling this story, um, or perhaps by painting a picture of a more idyllic childhood uh, made kind of the harsher parts of their story um, a little more, that, that much sadder, I guess, in a way, um, made it a, a way to where they could perhaps garner more support. Um, but it also got me thinking a lot about the lies that we sometimes tell ourselves um, that kind of shape who we become and, and how we also see the world and, and makes it a little easy or a little easier for us to accept who we are. So Ray starts their story saying that in 1893, her fa their father, William Sargent, married their mother, Alice Young. And on June 2nd, 1894, their only child, Edna Sargent, who I'll be referring to as Ray throughout the rest of the program because that's the name that they had chosen to go by for the rest of their life, uh, was born in Salina, Kansas. Now this is um, a 1900 census that shows the family. I'm just gonna highlight them here. So there's the dad and I'll zoom in so you guys can see it all a little bit better here. So let me zoom in, there we go. Um, so there is William Sargent highlighted there, listed as head of the household, Alice, 
and then their daughter. And here they are stating that they've been married seven years. So that all matches up. But according to the marriage record that I could find, which is this slide here, I'm going to highlight their wedding day. Can zoom in there for you too. Oops. They were actually married in 1897. So three years after Ray was born. Now it's a huge deal. Lots of families are, are kind of secretive <laughs> about children being born out of wedlock, wedlock. And you hear stories all the time about how people fudged numbers um, to kind of make the story a little bit more acceptable for public consumption. Now, in the first installment of this 11-part series that was written by Ray um, for the San Francisco Examiner, uh, they talk a lot about their early childhood, saying that um, their father was a uh, conductor on the railroad. But we can see again in that 1900 census that he wasn't actually a conductor but that he was actually, I'll zoom in here. You can see him listed right here, a brakeman. Um, again, not the biggest deal, little, little fudge. And she also claims that their mother, Alice, was from France. She was French. But we can actually see that Alice was born in Illinois and that her parents were born in New Jersey and Ohio. Ray then goes on to talk about um, what their life was like. And they continue to say things like, you know, their mother loved pretty, being French, she loved pretty things and dainty foods. They go on to say that we were the only people that I knew that had three forks on our table for dinner. It was quite a distinction, and the other children envied me when we when they came to our house. Our way of life was finer than most of the Kansians who surrounded us. They lived on cornbread and salt pork. Our fare simply awed them. Our house was full of laughter and sunlight. Now this, I, I can't prove one way or another. But again, I think that it is possible that Ray is kind of narratively setting a stage, kind of providing this socially acceptable, very middle class upbringing, this, this beautiful start to a life that turns a little tragic. Ray goes on to claim that their father died in 1903 when, when they were nine years old. Now, I found a different record that says he dies in 1916. I don't know if her parents divorced, separated, if they were abandoned. Um, all of these things are possible. I guess even bigamy is possible at, you know, this time. Um, but regardless, we do know that Ray's mother did remarry in 1903 uh, to a man by the name of Fred Kahn. And according to Ray, Fred was a very nice, kind man, um, but he had one big flaw. Uh, he was farm crazy. He really wanted to own a great big farm and he had no idea how to run one. And so the family attempts to, to run a farm in Missouri and that fails. And Fred takes what little money the family has left and purchases 250 acres in Arkansas. So here we see Ray again listed in a census this time for 1910. Uh, Fred and their mother Alice is listed on the previous page. But I'll zoom in here. So there's Edna Sargent, stepdaughter, and they're about 13 um, years old, or about 15 years old at this time. Um, so they are now living in Arkansas on this massive 250 acres, and this land is filled with trees and rocks. Not exactly an idyllic farmland landscape. 
And so before any of the, the plowing and planting can be done, they need to clear the land. The biggest hiccup is the family doesn't have any money to hire ranch hands. And so Ray, because of their French mother being so dainty, is then enlisted to take this part um, to assist her stepfather in clearing this space. And because of this, they're also forced to cease their education, which is kind of a sticking point, something that Ray brings up throughout um, their story about how important educating women really is. Um, the work is difficult and grueling, um, but Ray describes themselves as being husky and strong. And this is also the first time that they're dressing in male clothing in order to do this, this difficult work. And so they spend the next, you know, five years from 13 to 17 doing some of this kind of backbreaking labor. And when Ray is about 17 years old, they meet for the first time, Ernest Everett Brittendahl. And this is how they describe that meeting. He was the first man who ever regarded me as a woman. He was working on a Bronson on the Bronson Dam, and he is a carpenter by trade. I knew the woman who ran the cookhouse there and stopped by to see her on my way to the river. Brittendahl was leaving the camp. It was Sunday. I noticed him first because he wore better clothes than the men in that part of the country. I loved his kid gloves. So he had these nice soft leather gloves on when they met. Um, that was something I hadn't seen since I was in Kansas City. So they're really recalling this better time for themselves. They, they see this person who is the first person to kind of see them and they seem to be somebody who has their life together. He was quite a bit older. He was 32 at the time of their marriage in 1912. She, Ray was 18 at the time of their marriage. Um, Ray goes on to say that after meeting them at the cook at the cookhouse, um, Ray goes to the river to fish. Ernest kind of follows them down there and they chat a little bit. Um, Ray doesn't really see this as like flirting or courting, but Ernest goes back and asks some questions, inquires about her to the cookhouse woman, eventually comes to the farm, meets her stepfather, and they get married. Um, but there's actually another version of that story that I was able to find. Um, according to family records, there was an oral history that was done with the family member in 1891, and this is how they say the two actually met. That Ernest was visiting a brother of, of his, and um, while there, he put out an ad in a Lonely Hearts column in a local newspaper saying, young, handsome man with good income, object matrimony, and that Ray answered and that they were living with their parents on a farm down in the Ozarks and you know they decided they could get married so not exactly again this this love affair not a fireworks and excitement um to their courtship um Ray actually goes on to say in that 1924 article that when Ernest proposed marriage, that it seemed to me a way out. And they go on to kind of explain themselves. This is something that Ray will often do in these articles is kind of explaining away their, their behaviors at different times, but also if you kind of read between the lines a little bit, they're also making some pretty strong statements about society at that time. Um, I guess it's wrong to think of marrying for a way out of something that you didn't like, it, but it's done every day. During my life as a man, numberless men have told me that they were married for a meal ticket. And when they found it out, they became embittered and couldn't act as they would have had they been married for themselves, for love. 
But all the women who marry for a way out do not take the solving of their problem into their own hands as I did. They hang on, many of them, and suffer. Because it's the woman who suffers in the long run. My life as a man among other men, listening to the things that they have told me, has proven that to me. Now, Ray goes on to explain what being the spouse of Ernest Britton Dahl was like, and it definitely was not an easy one. So after their marriage, they leave the Midwest and they go to Colorado. And Ray says that they, you know, quickly began to realize that this wasn't going to be the, the same wedded bliss um, that supposedly her, their parents had. And so they soon find themselves back in overalls um, as Ernest leaves them alone to run a now 500 acre farm in Pueblo, Colorado. And he then leaves for months at a time because he's a railroad carpenter and, you know, goes wherever the work is needed. And so Ray is kind of just left to their own vices at this point. Um, it's during this time in Colorado that Ray also gives birth to their first daughter, uh, uh, Pauline. Um, this is then followed by the loss of a second child and then the birth of their second daughter, Doris, a few years after that. And Ray says that it was really after the birth of Doris that they begin to kind of plot their escape from Ernest. And the family moves to Trinidad, Colorado. And Ray kind of gets the push that they need um, to leave their husband. Now, also remember, this is at a time where things like this were not commonly happening. Um, women weren't leaving their husbands uh, very often, which I think is also what led Ray to, to make that comment about how women suffer. Um, so they are kind of going against the grain in multiple ways, um, from the jobs, the, the, the abilities that they have to kind of making these very personal decisions for themselves. Ray describes the marriage um, to Ernest as one that quickly goes downhill. Um, they say, you know, my husband had gone downhill so steadily since our marriage that I had often feared for his sanity. When we were first married, he used to shave and comb his hair. He was well-groomed and for a country man. And after my first baby was born, he stopped all of that. Every day, he seemed to get less and less neat and clean. And by the time Doris, the youngest, was born, he showed little care. And with that lack of interest in himself came a lack of character about his dealings with others. And that was a source of humiliation and annoyance to me. They also go on to describe um, violent outbursts by Ernest, um, threatening to murder Ray, to murder the children, uh, leaving them dressed in rags um, with no food, no money, while they go off as, you know, to attend their businesses as a railroad car carpenter. And that it was really after the death of their mother, Alice, that because she had always kind of forced Ray to stay with the hus with Ernest, with her husband, um, through their tears and pleadings, that Ray finally decided it was time to go. Now, in reality, um, there's other evidence that led me to believe that Alice actually stayed alive until the 1950s. Um, so what did Ray do? How did she escape? Well, they went across the street <laughs> with their daughters and had taken refuge with a woman by who's referred to in the papers as Mrs. Thomas Foster. Um, Mrs. Foster, who is Eliza Gordon Foster, uh, was a recent widow and had three boys, Thomas, Charles, and Francis. And they were kind of on the verge of poverty themselves. Um, her husband, Thomas, had passed away in um, February of 1919. 
in Long Beach. Uh, he had come to California as a help, one of the health seekers. Uh, they didn't really go into what kind of illness he had, and I couldn't really find that. Um, but he passed away, and her being a single mom at this point with three boys couldn't really keep the family finances going. Women were being paid, as <laughs> they continually are, a lot less than what men were able to earn. And so Ray and I'll refer to them as Gordon because that's the name that they chose to go through most of their life. Uh, Gordon kind of hatch a plan together to get out of Trinidad and hopefully in a way that they can't be followed because they were very worried about Ernest coming after them. So what did they do? Well, supposedly in conversation with each other late at night, um, Ray has an idea and cries, I got it. I'll dress as a man. Look, here are three good suits. Mrs. Foster's husband's suits were still hanging in the closet. Some shoes and some hats. I've been in overalls almost constantly since I was 13. I don't mind it a bit. I'm used to it. We'll cut off my hair and I'll wear these. So it's fate, right? Everything in their life has kind of been leading up to this moment. Um, and so they are perfectly comfortable being in male garb. And so it, after a, a brief bit of argument with Gordon, they, you know, Ray shouts, leave it to me and snatches the scissors and begins cutting their hair off. And then they go on to say, you know, she, they cut off all that they could reach and that Gordon had to finish the job. Then I put on Foster's clothes and began practicing a deep voice and a man's manner. The walk I didn't have to bother with. A woman who lives in overalls and lives as much in the saddle as I had on those Colorado plains doesn't mince along like a flapper. So it seemed, again, they're kind of explaining, well, this is the obvious choice. You would have done the same, potentially. They're really trying to set up this story to give a rational, a rational explanation for what they're doing. Because again, do they have any other option when they're doing something as big as transing gender? Now, according to the article, um, it's actually Gordon, Mrs. Foster, who comes up with the name Ray. And they decide to use um, Ray's maiden name, Sergeant, as the surname. And one thing that really kind of also struck me about this transformation in the, this, especially that moment of transformation in this article, is that the way it's described, they give not only the date it happened, but the time. At midnight, July 8th, 1920, I stood before the mirror of the sitting room in Mrs. Foster's house at Trinidad, Colorado, dressed as a man. So in, in some ways, it almost acts like a birth announcement. Now that's a little bit of my modern sensibilities in that, but everything else that they, they talk about is slightly vague. But Four years later, when she is, when Ray is telling this story, they remember the time and date that it happened. So to me, that that's something in that reading between the lines that seems very significant about what they're doing, about how they're transing gender. Now, they're worried about whether or not Ray can pass. And so that night after becoming Ray Sergeant, um, they take a little trip at night just to see if anybody recognizes Ray or any questions come about and they have no issue. And then Ray decides that they're gonna try it in the daytime. And so they go out within this small, you know, mainly mining community and seems, to be able to pass without anyone recognizing them. Um, they even talk about running into a group of women that they knew and 
kind of letting them in on it. Like, oh, by the way, you know, this is, this is me. We know each other and told them that they were planning on leaving and that they were very sympathetic and kind of promised to carry their secret. So soon the family decides that they're going to purchase train tickets and, and leave Trinidad and they're going to kind of leave as a family. Um, but they didn't want to bring more suspicion on the family because everybody knew Mrs. Foster in the community. They didn't want Mrs. Foster walking around with this strange man. So they decided to board the train separately. And this is how Ray kind of describes that. I got up the steps somehow with shaking knees, fell into a train seat. Mrs. Foster and the five children entered from the other end of the carriage. We pulled out of Trinidad. Faster and faster we flew. Raymond T. Sargent, his wife, and his children. Behind was the ghost of Edna Brittendahl. I was free for the first time in my 25 years. I was going to have an even break with the world. I was a man. So that's how the family really comes to, to be together. And that's how they're going to spend really the next four years together. So this again is, is a photo of Ray there in the hat and Gordon, along with Gordon's three sons, Thomas, Charles, and Francis, who are all standing next to Ray, and uh, Ray's two daughters, Pauline and Doris, around 1913, 1923, 1924. Now, they first decide to go to Wyoming because they, they think that's going to kind of throw Ernest off their scent. And Ray quickly gets, you know, kind of day laborer jobs, cleaning up, repairing roads. Uh, Gordon gets a job in a local laundry. And they initially decide while in Wyoming that they're going to pose as brother and sister versus husband and wife. But <laughs> that ruse doesn't go over too well. Um, which I think is for kind of an interesting reason. Um, Ray describes it as such. We were in our lodgings at Sheridan quite a while when we found out that this posing as brother and sister wasn't going over well with the public at all. I was naturally gallant to Mrs. Foster because we had started out that way when I was posing as her husband. One night I overheard my landlady and her husband talking. It's not right for those little children, I heard her say to him. That man and woman are no more married than the man in the moon is. I was dumbfounded, Ray says. When I heard the first part of her sentence, I figured that she had pierced my disguise, that she had guessed me to be a woman, but she had not. She had come to the conclusion that it was an illegitimate love affair, that either one of us had abandoned a mate to elope together with our children. So... Ray in this masculine role was just too attentive, um, didn't act like a brother would to a woman, but more like somebody who is romantically linked, um, which I thought was interesting that they let that story be in there. So they then decide that um, the family's going to split up. Uh, Ray is going to take their children because they don't want to keep arousing suspicion and they're going to go to California and Ray ends up getting a job as a ranch foreman in Hayward, uh, California. Um, but along the way, they discover that being an unattached male um, also posed some new problems. Um, Talking about the uh, the ride from Wyoming to California, um, they say that, you know, women, girls, the whole feminine world that seeks the smiles, the companionship, the admiration of men were let loose about my head. I was an eligible man, a widower. That's what they decided to pose as in order to um, be traveling with the two young girls. I was material for capture, open to the trap of sex that was to be laid for me at every turn. This was something I had not experienced during my journey with my wife and five children because then I was a family man on the job every moment of the time. So they begin to tell some of these stories of their meetings with women 
Um, one particular story that they end up telling um, was an interesting one. So they're they're in Hayward for a period of time. Um, Ray is loving it. They're working outdoors. They're you know working with their hands. They become quite good at being a farm hand. Um, they really enjoy it, and they're also very careful to never drop um, their quote unquote disguise. Um, living as a male twenty four seven. Um, but Ray says that they begin to miss the family. They state that, you know, the only thing to spoil my happiness at this time was that Mrs. Foster was not with me. Uh, the fact that she, she was still in Sheridan, Wyoming with the boys. Um, but instead of admitting to any feelings um, beyond, you know, the fact that she wasn't there was a kind of explain away um, that Gordon had written them saying, you know, it's getting awfully cold here. It's expensive to buy the boys, you know, clothing for the winter, even though they're from Colorado and would have, I would imagine, winter clothing and things like that. Um, but it's so expensive to kind of keep them warm that it's decided you know what we're gonna we're gonna come out to hayward and live with you on on this ranch and that's exactly what they do so the family is kind of reunited again um and they spend some of their happiest days on that ranch in hayward um but then the ranch is eventually sold and they go up to um, oakland and so it's there that they're getting other kind of labor jobs. And Ray takes a job in a soap factory and Gordon takes a job in a laundry and things are kind of going along well. Um, but then, you know, Ray is just turning women's heads left and right in this factory. And one woman in particular who they call Louise that they met in the soap factory um, just won't leave them alone. And, because he is portraying themselves as this happily married man, you know, he he hopes that will be enough of a cover, but it just doesn't work out. And he is kind of forced to go on this double date to the movies. And this is how Ray talks about the outing. Um, it was my first and rather startling glimpse into just what these girls thought about going out with a man. I didn't kiss Louise goodnight, although she pouted her scarlet lips at me in the most inviting fashion in the world. But I did put my arm about her waist and let it drop tenderly and rather unconcernedly about her figure. Though I was afraid to kiss her, she was mine for the asking. I could see all mine. It was the strangest thing in the world to feel like that. That I, a woman, was getting this strange, uncanny experience of a young woman's infatuation. To go further perhaps meant danger for me. I said good night. It was my only encounter of this kind with Louise, because there are other encounters that they will have. Um, for I was cut off the payroll soon after when a general reduction in help was made. So again, they kind of explain in a way like they they kind of treat some of these interactions in this news in the newspaper accounts as almost like scientific experiments. Like I just wanted to see how far things could go. I really got into the mindset of being male. Um, again, there's there is that constant worry of what this could legally mean for them. And that is going to eventually rear its head. But in the meantime, Ray, Gordon, and their five children continue to live together as a family until May of 1924. So for four straight years, each kind of taking on different jobs. Um, you know, their laborers are moving back and forth between Berkeley and Oakland trying to find work. Um, but they're never really ceasing these kind of self-determined gender roles. Gordon is mama to the family. Ray is daddy to the family. Um, and by the fall of 1923, Ray says that 
I had long ceased to worry about being caught. All fear of being revealed a woman had passed from me. My voice, my face, my gestures were all as naturally masculine by now as the air I breathed. But unfortunately, that would soon all fall apart. Mainly because Ernest kept looking for Ray and Pauline and Doris. Um, beginning in about January of 1921. So Ray leaves in July of 1920. And by January of 1921, I start to find a few listings in California papers um, that Ernest had contacted local authorities um, to fi help find his wife. Um, he wouldn't actually tell the police what happened that, you know, she was she fled in the cover of darkness, pretty much, with the children. He would tell local police that um, the family had just moved ahead of him and that, silly him, he lost their address. And so he knows that they're in this particular area, but really he's, he's contacting authorities all up and down California um, to see if anybody has heard anything. And if and he's even willing to offer a twenty dollar reward for anyone who can provide information about his family's whereabouts. Now, Ray did keep in touch with some people in Trinidad, and they wrote letters to them in California, uh, sending their letters to basically just general delivery but addressed to Edna Brittendahl. Now, somehow Ernest discovered this and sent a letter to Ray requesting that they return home with the children because they needed them uh, around harvesting time. And Ray actually decided to respond to this letter, stating that I had decided when I left that I would never go back to Ernest Brittendahl and my decision held. We had one ambition, to take up homesteads in Colorado, build a house on the line between the two, and live there together with the children. So she's talking, the Ray's talking about Gordon and themselves. Um, rent part of the land to cattlemen and go out and work one at a time to keep us going. That way, the one at home tended the children and the children of the one out working held the homestead for their mother. We decided to stick it out until we could save enough to do that. So that's kind of the plan that they've decided to come up with. But what actually led Ray to being exposed was that they wrote Brittendahl to tell them to leave them alone. Um, but as they say, I did not think that the flame of revenge would burn so well for four long years. I did not dream that he would start a persecution of me that would reach far beyond those miles that Ray Sargent had traveled, would reach into my life as a man and disclose my secret. For it is because of Brittendahl's lying letters to the authorities about me and my neglect of my children as he who left them to starve chooses to call it that I had to abandon my life as a man and go back to the name and sex of Edna Brittendahl. Now, by 1924, Ray and Gordon are financially struggling. Um, Ray is able to make a few dollars more than Gordon a day. Um, but it still wasn't enough. They're, again, they're laborers. Um, the work isn't always consistent for Ray. And they had heard that at this time in California, a widow's pension could be provided to um, any widow who had lived in California for at least two years. And believing that this $60 a month of this widow's pension would tremendously helped the family, kind of providing a stable base level income for them, um, Gordon applied to the Welfare League. But the information about Gordon needed to be verified. And so um, what they did uh, was they wrote back to Colorado to first find out if she really was the widow of Thomas Foster. And the answer, as Ray says, evidently carried more information than that for what it 
for for it added that she was living in Oakland as Mrs. Sargent. So someone back there said, oh yeah, she was a widow, but I heard she got married to this Sargent guy and is you know now living in California. Uh, so this made the Welfare League kind of suspicious of what was going on and, and her right to collect this widow's pension. So they actually went to Gordon's work at the laundry and um, she kind of explained away the story, um, but then they came to the address um, that the family lived and asked the landlady uh, if there was a Mrs. Foster that lived there. And they said, oh no, it's just Mr. and Mrs. Sargent and their children that are living here. Um, they then asked Gordon's sons, uh, if they knew anyone by the name of Sergeant, and they answered, oh yeah, of course, he's our daddy. Um, so while Ray and Gordon were being investigated, Ernest, Ray's husband, also sends a letter to the Red Cross in Oakland saying that Ray and Gordon are posing as husband and wife, and that the children were being neglected and never sent to school. So the Welfare League and the Red Cross investigate and they come to the house and Ray at that point decides that they have to kind of come clean, as they say, um, just to let them know that, you know, Ward was not defrauding the state because she is a widow, um, that she has not remarried because I am also a woman and they could hardly believe, bring themselves to believe me. So now the their life that they've kind of built together over the last four years is starting to crumble. And the Red Cross actually, uh, and the Welfare League, kind of press Ray about why they're portraying themselves as male and kind of dangle carrots. Like, well, if you decide to stay home because, you know, Mrs. Foster has a job, Gordon has a job, so if you stay home, wear women's clothes, take care of the children, cook and clean, we can make sure that you have some food in your pantry and we can give you at least rent money. Um, but Ray kind of bristles against this. They don't want to give up the life that they had. They don't want to give up the, the benefits, the advantages of being male in this society. And... Um, they then take it one step further and start to begin to threaten Ray with arrest, um, that she is deceiving their, her employers and things like that. So um, then the inevitable kind of happens when a story like this gets out is it starts to make headlines. And we still see that today, whenever anybody is transing gender, it becomes huge news. And that wasn't any different. So when the story broke uh, in the San Francisco Examiner on May 3rd, 1924, that Ray had been masquerading, as they called it, um, for the last four years, that returning to the life of Ray Sargent might have felt pretty impossible. Uh, so Ray told the newspapers that what they were going to do is that they were going to get a little money together, buy a car, go back to Colorado and get a divorce. And then they would stand free and fair and square before the world. Mrs. Foster and I will try to take up our double homestead. We'll lease some land of uh, some of our land to cattlemen and that will give us a little income. Then each one will mind the combined families, their three boys and my two girls with the other goes away and works. We'll take turns at this so that each can have some time of the, uh, with their children part of the year. And that's where it seems that things end. So do you think they did that? Do you think that they actually returned to Colorado and purchased that property? You can kind of give it a little thumbs up, thumbs down or in the chat, yes or no. I'm gonna take a drink of water real quick. They didn't exactly do that. Um, by February of 1925, it looks as if Ray and Gordon are no longer living together. 
Uh, Gordon, it turns out, remains in the Bay Area with their three sons and by 1930 uh, has purchased a home in Berkeley. And by 1935 did remarry. Um, they married a, a person by the name of Fred Frederick William Coles. And they lived until 1992, dying at the age of 98. And I often wonder if this is a story that the, the descendants knew about, knew about this time that they're, because uh, Gordon's children had children. Um, if they knew anything about the life that their grandmother had once led. Um, makes you wonder how many other stories in your family might there be um, about times in their life where they they took a different path. So Ray, along with their two daughters, moved to the Sherman Oaks area near LA and was now going by the name Paul Sirod or Sirod. Um, the name Paul is for their daughter Pauline. And the last name, Sirod or Sirod, however they pronounced it, is actually the name of their daughter, Doris, <laughs> spelled backwards. So I thought that was a pretty inventive way to come up with their name. And now Ray, or Paul, as it were, is working as a carpenter when police pick them up because an arrest warrant is filed um, for them stemming from Ray being unable to pay a garage bill. Uh, they needed two tires replaced on the car, so they were able to buy a car. Um, but they were able to purchase them on credit and uh, weren't able to pay the bill. So when Ray is initially picked up, they give the police the name Paul Sirod. Um, But after a period of time of kind of being questioned, Ray informs them of their legal name and gender, and the charges are then expanded um, to uh, obtaining money and goods or services under false pretenses. And Ray goes into the explanation of this is this is the only way I can make money. I'm trying to raise my two girls correctly, properly. I'm trying to make sure that they are getting a good education. And the only way I can really afford to do any of this is by portraying myself as male because men make more money. And the work I can do, I can't, I'm not trained to cook clean, you know, those, those feminine roles, those feminine jobs that I'm permitted to have don't pay enough and I can't do them. I've been doing men's work my entire life. And I'm just asking to be permitted to continue to do that. And it seems that they earn some sympathy for this. There's a couple of opinion pieces in the LA Times and in other papers where people are actually very supportive. And there starts to be a little talk about, you know, wage gaps and how women, you know, as they're going more and more into this workforce are supposed to be able to afford afford a comfortable life. But of course, there is that pushback against that as well is like, well, that's not their place. Their place is to be wives and mothers um, and not worry about um, funding their own lives. Now, unfortunately, Ray is arrested a second time um, in June of 1925, this time for passing two bad checks. Um, they signed them with either the name R.G. Gill or Jack Sargent. Um, so once again, they are brought into court and Ray again makes the argument that, you know, the only way they can make money is to dress in male clothing and go by a male name. And they are eventually paroled or given probation, I should say, on a condition that they can no longer live and work as male. Now, I have not seen a probation given on those grounds before at all. And I think the only reason this is permitted is because LA, where they are picked up the second time, um, has an, a city ordinance, an anti-masquerading ordinance that had been in, uh, had been uh, part of statutes since about 1894. 
And it actually stems from this, from the La Fiestas that used to happen. And there was an all fools night at the end of that. And people would dress up in costumes and often people dressed in, in opposite genders during all fools night. And a lot of local ministry was very upset by this. And so city council decided to pass this ordinance, not permitting people of you know, of wearing the clothes of an opposite gender, these anti-masquerading ordinances. And it's actually those ordinances that continued to be enforced up until like the 1950s and 60s um, to arrest um, transgendered people um, because they were posing as the opposite biological gender. Um, and so that that actually continued on the books until about the 1970s in Los Angeles. Um, so Ray, at this point, I'm guessing feels like their hands are kind of tied. Um, so they agreed to this in order to get probation. Um, but then they are picked up once again. They are dressed, they are arrested for dressing in male apparel and accused of writing a bad check for six dollars and they are then sentenced to one to 14 years in san quentin now do you think this is a fair sentence one to 14 years in san quentin for breaking their probation isis is actually going to put up a poll this time to kind of get your thoughts as to whether or not you think Ray should have been sentenced for that length of time for breaking their probation. So you can either select yes, no, or, you know, I would have chosen an alternative sentence. All right, the poll is up and we have already a lot of answers. I'll give it a couple more seconds in case the last couple want to answer. But... Okay, right. well. Looks like the uh, the majority of you feel like no. <laughs> Looks like everybody pretty much voted no, that um, the, the sentence does not seem like a fair or just one. Um, they did end up um, serving a few years in San Quentin. Uh, they may have been released in, after two years. It's a little bit gray. There's this clipping I found um, from the San Francisco Examiner in 1927 that states that Ray would be paroled um, once proper female employment is found for them. So they're only going to be released if they can get a job working as a woman. Um, I'm uncertain if Ray was out of San Quentin by then, um, because there was an article written that I found in 1932 by a former San Quentin inmate that actually mentions Ray. Uh, this was written um, by a, a young woman by the name of uh, Dorothy Ellingson. Um, she was known as the jazz baby murderer. Uh, she actually murdered her mother um, because the, the basic story is her mother wouldn't let her go to a jazz club when she was uh, 16. And so um, she murdered her in order to go. But she was being released from San Quentin in 1932. And she wrote a three series article about what life was like in the women's prison in San Quentin, especially because now it was getting ready to, uh, the women's ward was going to be transferred to, to Hatchapi. And so they mention Ray in this article when talking about this series um, of what life is like in no man's land, as they referred to as the women's ward uh, at San Quentin, that oftentimes, you know, books that dealt with Lord romance would often be kind of passed around um, in, in prison. And in especially one in particular, which was called Ladies of the Underworld, in which women posed as men. Um, that was one that lots of women were interested in and, and gloated over actually reading it. They go on to say that um, everyone will remember the case of Edna Brittendahl, who posed for years as a man. 
they say to the very point of marrying a woman, I never found any of that to be true. But Edna has a following in San Quentin where she is an influential prisoner. Um, so she may have still been in San Quentin by 1932, but it does seem by 1933, she, they have been released. Um, I came across this little snippet in the uh, Modesto B saying situations wanted man and wife experienced ranch life need work good health reliable hardworking people references furnished addressed Everett Brittendall but I don't think that Everett is Ernest's middle name so it's Ernest Everett Brittendall um, I don't believe that Ray stayed with Ernest long um it does seem though that Ray decided to stay in Northern California after their release, because I do find a few more scrapes with the law that Ray has. Not necessarily for wearing um, men's clothing though. Um, they are uh, arrested twice in 1937, one for um, a DUI um, in which they're given a 25 day term. And the ages, the name, spelling of the name, Mrs. Ray Sargent, um, all falls in line with other documents that I'm able to find about Ray later in their life. Uh, and then they're also arrested uh, for a petty theft. Though it doesn't really seem like much kind of comes out of that. Um, in the 1940 census, I'm able to track Ray down again. Um, this time living with a woman by the name of Abba Harlow. Uh, they had apparently been living together uh, since at least 1935. I'm going to highlight that for you here. So there's Ray listed as head of the house. And there's Abba. And it shows uh, this particular um, census had asked you know where they were living in 1935 and so they said the same place and it looks like the two had lived together from 1935 up until abba's death in 1951 because i found abba's um obituary notice in which it says, you know, she made her home here with Mrs. Ray Sargent of 1015 Juanita Boulevard. Now, you might be wondering what happened to Ernest. Um, I found a little bit about what might have happened to him. It seems that he did live with Ray on and off, but in a very different way. Um, this is a remembrance um, written by Ernest and Ray's granddaughter about their recollections of their grandmother and grandfather. I never knew my grandfather Ernest as a child because he was never around. Thinking back when I was a small child, he came to Salinas one Christmas Eve, brought my brother Mickey and I a coloring book, crayons, and candy. Shortly after that, he was gone and I never saw him again until he became much older. At that time, he had moved back with my grandma Edna, which at the time living across the street from us at Salinas, California. He lived out back with her uh, from her place in a trailer. He was never in attendance of our holidays or any other social activities. He lived more or less as a hermit and didn't want to be bothered. I always felt sad for him because he, al he was always alone and no one to visit with. My grandmother took care of him quite well during his old age, and he kept to himself, always a mystery to me. But she did have very good remembrances of Ray. She was good to Mickey and me. Um, while we were growing up, she always made sure we got anything we needed. As a child, I remember many good times with my grandmother. She had a heart of gold, and I was astonished at how many friends and flowers were at her funeral. So Ray Sargent died um, at the age of 64 on May 11th, 1959 in Salinas, California. Um, and what's interesting, she dies in, in May of 1959. So that was 35 years after she, after they had been outed um, as being dressed in male clothing. 
And I, I wondered when I saw this, you know, if they, how they continued to, to carry themselves in the world. If they continued, you know, they, they stuck with the name Ray Sargent, slightly different spelling, but still kind of remembering that, that birth of Ray way back in 1920, in July of 1920. And the type of work that they seem to have done for the remainder of their life was um, working outdoors, working on farms, lettuce picker, hops picker. Um, and so they did spend the last of their days um, outside and in overalls. So hopefully they did get to kind of end their life um, in, in a way that felt most comfortable to them. So that also takes me to the end of this particular story. Does anyone have any final cots, comments or thoughts or questions? If you are typing those now, I also wanna pose one other question to you that I had at the very beginning. Why do gender stereotypes exist? What is that value or perceived value um, that we have to attributing something as being masculine or feminine, especially when it comes to jobs and clothing and, you know, things of interests, mannerisms. Because it does create a big impact on the lives of people. I have a question, excuse me, from Ruth. Uh, she asks, is it still illegal to masquerade as the opposite sex? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, technically, no. <laughs> technically, no. Um, if you are a transgendered person, um, it, it is not illegal. Arguments can be made um, and have been made uh, by police um, that it is attempts to cover up other malicious intent. Um, so while the act of doing so isn't necessarily illegal, depending on what you were doing um, while dressed as the opposite biological gender um, can, does actually um, oftentimes affect your treatment in the judicial system. Um, when we think about things like bathroom laws getting passed now, uh, if someone is outwardly appearing as male and goes into the men's restroom, but they are biologically female or the reverse happens, there's there's been a lot of debate about whether or not laws can be created around that. And there are still many parts, not just internationally, but definitely in the United States that are, you know, trying to, to pass these laws, basing them under the concerns of individual safety. But I, you know, that that is very de debatable as to whether or not that is true. So that's my answer to that, Ruth. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna give it just a couple seconds more for any final thoughts you guys might have, any questions or comments before we go. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, Jenny, do you have a upcoming programs or is that? Yes, I do. Um, so this is our upcoming events. Um, we have a couple more Zoom talks uh, coming up next month. On September 11th at 2 p.m., we're going to be discovering the movie's first Native Americans. We're going to actually be joined um, by a UCLA professor who has done a great deal of research, um, Angela Aylis, um, into the history of Native American representation and especially that silent film era. Um, so they will be sharing some very interesting stories of those first um, people of Native American birth um, and their work 
both in, in front of the camera and behind the scenes. And then on September 25th, uh, Paul Spitzeri, the museum director, will be back um, telling the story of uh, how the workmen and temple families navigated a new century, uh, the 1900s in Los Angeles. And then on October 7th, our nonfiction book club is going to be kicking off their new series on uh, U.S. history. There will be reading The Warmth of Other Suns, the epic story of America's Great Migration by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, if you want to sign up for any of these programs or you want to read a little bit more about them, uh, just head on over to homesteadmuseum.org to uh, check those out. Also, you can um, follow us on social media. We're on um, Instagram, Facebook, mostly, and you'll find us at Homestead Museum. And with that, we have one last other question from Mike. He wants to know if there's any more female justice episodes, I assume, coming up. Yes, uh, we will have one last one for the year in October. I believe it's October 16th. We will be talking Christine Collins. Um, so most famously played by Angelina Jolie in the movie, The Changeling. Um, so Christine Collins was a real woman in LA in the 1920s whose young son Walter went missing. And when they reported it to the police, um, the police supposedly found her son and brought uh, a boy to her that was discovered uh, I believe in the Chicago area. And um, she was told to take him home and try him out. And when she returned with the boy a few weeks later with a lot of evidence under her arm about the fact that this was not her son, um, the LA Police Department uh, placed her into an institution for making them look foolish. Uh, meanwhile, it looks like you know, other more nefarious things had happened um, with her child, uh, as well as other boys at that time. So it's a story about her, her plight in kind of navigating the justice system, especially as a single mother at this time in the 1920s and um, the impacts that could have. So keep an eye out for that October 16th. All right, thank you all for coming and we hope we will see you in future programming. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks everyone, have a good day.